If you would uh, turn with me to um, Joshua uh, chapter number five, Joshua chapter five, Brother Bailey, you certainly uh, blessed us, uh, brought tears to my eyes. I had to hold the tears back, um, understanding it was just a rendition, uh, and I just didn't want to be bawling and crying, but um, my, 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 the Lord has certainly gifted you. He really has, and I, um, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard what the Lord has in store uh, for you. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 5, we'll commence reading at, um, at verse uh, number 1. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until, until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the, Lord, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land, which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass that when they had done the circumcising, all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. You may be seated. Everything that I read was in the scripture even though you might not have liked some of the words, but they're in the scripture. And I think uh, Sister Pinky Boston says it best. If the Lord said it, then I can say it. Amen. Just for a little while today, I, I want to I talk from the subject. I want to talk about rolling away the shame of your past, rolling away the shame of your past. In verse 9, the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach uh, of Egypt from off you. Uh, so uh, today I want to talk about rolling away the shame of your past, or maybe uh, rolling away the reproach of your past. The word reproach is not a word we use uh, every day, uh, but it is a word that we uh, need to be familiar with as we look at this uh, pericope of scripture uh, on today. Webster's, it defines uh, the word um, reproach as a cause or occasion of blame, discredit, uh, or disgrace. Used in a sentence, someone might say his conduct has brought uh, shame and reproach to uh, his family. 
Uh, maybe her affair has caused her to disappear from uh, the public scene because of shame, because of reproach. In the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the word uh, translated um, reproach is uh, chirpah, which it speaks of the kind of disgrace that would become an opportunity for someone to taunt you or laugh at you or to uh, mock you. Vines, uh, Expository Dictionary, uh, it says that uh, the reproach would receive abuse by the words spoken against them and by the rumors which were spread about them. In your life, uh, have you ever experienced a season where um, you were subjected to reproach or disgrace because of poor choices you made in your life? Uh, sometimes we can be susceptible to reproach for reasons beyond our control, and sometimes uh, it is uh, reasons for which we have messed up, and, and now uh, we are in a situation of uh, uh, reproach. Uh, maybe um, you are here today, and if you are honest uh, with yourself, we can all think of times, uh, Sister Butler, where we have made poor choices in our lives and we want to go stick our head in the sand and we want to hide and never be seen. Uh, you have been there before. Uh, even if nobody else knew about it but God and Satan knew about it, but you knew in your own heart about the reproach that was in your life. So as you think about those seasons in your life of, uh, of your own disgrace and reproach, uh, 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 think about the times that, that you were made fun of, you were talked about, uh, you were made a mockery of, you experienced emotional uh, punishment either from Satan or from people that taunted you and they knew about your poor choices. I'll pretty much guarantee that you... Uh, that you went through this if you have ever been down that road of reproach. You know, God, he loves us. And he does not want to, us to remain uh, in a point or a state of being paralyzed because of our past poor choices. He does not want us to be stuck in the reproach of our poor choices, but God wants us to have the victory in the present as well as the future despite our troubled, our, our checkered past. And today we're going to learn uh, how uh, to, uh, to, to go through these things and to move beyond these type of situations. We're going to look at the, the lives of, of some people that, that had a life of reproach and, and they were stuck in this life of reproach. But, but then we find how God rolled away uh, their shame. Uh, they had uh, made some poor choices. But really, it was their parents that had made the, the poorest of choices. Their parents sadly remained in a state of reproach because of their stubbornness and refusal to listen to what God was saying and follow God out of their situation. But, but for the children who learned from their, their parents' mistakes, uh, uh, things turned out quite differently for them. If you have any reproach that you would like to get rid of today, I want you to pay attention to the, the message and you'll discover a way out. By way of context, the nation of Israel, they have just crossed the, the Jordan River on dry land through the miraculous work of God and now they are camped at a place uh, that would soon be named uh, Gilgal. It, it, it meant uh, 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 the rolling or, or, or wheel, and, and it was a name that would remind them and future generations of, of what God uh, was about to do with the reproach that had been in their life for some 40 years. In this place, they would call Gilgal. They have just erected uh, 12 stones of memorial stones that, that were uh, made with stones they took out of the middle of the Jordan River. And they did this to remind the future generations of God's miraculous parting of, um, of the Jordan River. And this is where we'll pick up our account in a moment. 
But many of you, you are here today, and you cannot uh, move uh, past your past. You cannot move even into your future or your present because you are too busy looking in the past. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit uh, for the kingdom of God. But Joshua and Caleb, along with, with 10 other spies, 40 years before our text, they, they had gone into Canaan land to spy out the land, and Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report, but the other ten spies came back with an evil report. But, 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 but other than Joshua and Caleb, uh, uh, the people did not have the faith to enter the land and take possession of the land, but, but they were afraid like many of us are today. So what they did, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 Long years, And this is what God told them in Numbers 14, 29. He said that their carcasses would fall in the wilderness and, and all that were with them that were 20 years and older that had murmured against uh, uh, God uh, would die in the wilderness. And then he told them in verse uh, 33 that they would wander in the wilderness. And he said... For every day you went in the land and spied out the land, you will wander for, for one year for every day. So for 40 years, they had to wander in the wilderness. But then he told Joshua and Caleb uh, that although they were 20 years and, and, uh, and older, that they would live to go into the, the land. So here we are, 40 years later, they had had already crossed the Red Sea, and Moses had already died, and Joshua is now the leader of the people. And in chapter 3 uh, uh, of Joshua, they, they crossed a Jordan River uh, whose banks were, were overflowing, and now they are in Canaan land. I'm going to help you today, I assure you. You just, you just ride with me for a little bit. But in verse 1 of our text, and and now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan, all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Uh, their enemies had already known about God drying up the Jordan River for the children of Israel to cross over. And, and these kings probably had been banking on the fact that the Jordan River would serve as a, a barrier against an invasion from them or anyone else. And, and their hearts have now melted and they no longer have any courage, Brother Parker, to, 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 to face the children of Israel. God had impressed these fears upon them as he had promised in in Exodus 23 and 27, he said, I will send my fear before me and I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And, and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. I will send hornets before thee, which will drive out the Hittite, the Canaanite, and the Hivite from before thee. We need to know that God is still in the business of impressing fear upon our enemies and will drive them out before us. But you know why we never find this out, Sister Teresa? We never find out that God will drive our enemies out from before us. It's because we move too soon. We run the other way. We give up too soon and we never come to the point to see that God has already worked it out force. Now, they were okay as long as the Jordan was, was overflowing. The enemies were, but, but once it dried up, it was uh, uncontestable uh, proof that God was on the children of Israel's side. Look with me in verses 2 and 3. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives, and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Horaluth. We must realize that all the males uh, that had been born in the wilderness uh, 
hadn't been circumcised and, and God wanted the children of Israel to renew the observance that they had neglected for almost 40 years. Back in uh, Genesis 17, God had commanded that as a token of his covenant that every male child be circumcised when he was eight days old. And if not, according to Genesis 17, 14, that soul was to be cut off from the people because the covenant had been broken. Almost 40 years without observing this most important covenant, God wanted them to renew. He wanted them to renew it before they went any further. Now, they have crossed the River Jordan. They're on the other side. They're now in Canaan land, but they're really just at the, at the mouth of Canaan land. They're at the entrance of Canaan land. But in essence, God said, stop right there. It's something that you need to now renew. There's a, there's a covenant that you need to renew before you go, go any further. My question today to all of us is, what do you need to renew in your life today? What is it before you go any further that you need to renew in your life today? Every six months or every year, we renew our car insurance, home insurance. We renew all these different things, stuff we don't even, we even need. It's on auto renewal. But, but, but what is it in your life spiritually that you need to renew today? What's been neglected in your life for, for a long time? Maybe it's your devotion uh, to the Lord where, where you're not having a devotion. Maybe it is your church membership where you've been out of church for, for too long and you need to renew uh, your commitment to the Lord through the Lord's house. Maybe you need to renew today serving in the Lord's house. You come in Sunday after Sunday, but you know in your heart of hearts that you are not serving the Lord the way he would have you to. You're seated, you, you're seated on your blessed assurance. But in verse 2, it says, At that time, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua. So God told Joshua what he wanted Joshua to do with all of those that were, were there, all the men that was there. You know, circumcision is, is very painful. These are adults. Circumcision is very painful, but some of our renewals, the renewals in life will be painful. Sometimes where you have to buckle down and you have to renew some things and it's going to be painful, it's going to hurt, it's going to take a lot of effort and energy, but, 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 but you got to do it. But I want you to notice something with me, that, that Joshua, he fully trusted uh, the Lord. Look, look there in verse 3. In verse number three, what, what, does it, what does it tell us in verse three? And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the, the foreskins. Uh, 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 immediately, immediately, Joshua wasn't there asking a whole bunch of questions, but Joshua immediately moved about and did what God called for him to do. Joshua knew that circumcising these men who were ready for battle, you do realize that there, there were enemies, there were giants that were in the land. Remember, 40 years before, there were enemies in the land. They were still there in the land. So, so the children of Israel understood that they would have to fight when they went into this land. So Joshua knew that circumcising these men who were ready for battle would put them out of commission for at least two weeks. They, they were some uh, 1.2 miles away from their enemies, and, and Joshua knew that, that his entire camp could be annihilated. That, you see that simple word, could. I mean, that, see, we ride too much on could. 
We, we, we look at could. I mean, this could happen. This could happen. That could happen. We look for every reason not to follow what the Lord says. Uh, Joshua knew that the camp could be annihilated, but what he did is something that we often don't do. He trusted the Lord and he obeyed the Lord, despite what could happen. It's a whole bunch of coulds. Is that how you live your life on coulds? Well, this could happen, that could happen. You can't live your life like that. But our failure to obey God based upon what could happen is the absolute enemy of achieving greatness. You will never. Now, I told you I'm going to help you. You can never achieve greatness in your life if you're basing everything on what could go wrong. You're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're waiting for problems. Pro let, me, let me tell you something before you even get going. Problems are going to come. Oh, you're going to have a lot of obstacles and problems when God calls for you to do whatever. But if God called you to it, he'll lead you through it. But Joshua, in the jaws of his enemies, reduced the majority of his army to a state of total helplessness and simply trusted in the arm of God. He, a little more than a mile away from his enemies, he, he did something to reduce them to a state of helplessness. But he trusted God through it. They, they were put in a place uh, Sister Boston, where, where they couldn't do anything but trust God and God alone, it was a hard place, but it was a good place. That, that's a good place to be. When, when, when you cannot trust anything or anyone but God, it is a hard place, but it's a good place. The question could be asked, why didn't God order them to be circumcised on the, on the other side of the, the Jordan in a better state of security? See the excellency of his power. He's amazing. The same reason God chose to let them pass over the Jordan during the time of the year where the, where the banks would overflow and not at the time of the year where it was easy to cross. I, I mean, God just allows these difficult situations to come in, Sister Teresa. So we, let me, let me tell you first what David said in, in, in Psalm 40, verse 1. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. I mean, that is something to shout about. Yeah. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me. And heard my cry. But look at verse 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet up on a rock and established my goings. Oh, uh, y'all, yeah, yeah. That, that, you missed your little place to shout right there because, because, because we find that God did not keep David from the pit, but he did deliver him once he got. We want to always be delivered from even going into the pit. But, 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 but God allowed David to, to go into the pit, but he delivered him out of the pit. And, and then David said in verse 3, and he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Listen, church. It wasn't until after the pit, Brother Jason, that God gave David a new song. He had to go through something. Y'all ain't getting me. Y'all ain't getting me. Y'all not getting me. You're not, you're not getting me on today. It, it, it wasn't until after the pit that God gave David a new song. In the movie, uh, 
No, y'all too sanctimonious. Y'all ain't never seen the five heartbeats. I have numerous times. And in the movie, The Five Heartbeats, when Duck was on stage receiving a reward, the same night he found out about his girlfriend cheating uh, on him with his brother. With pain in his eyes and in his heart, he quoted the words of a music critic who had said about him sometime earlier, said that, that, that Donald uh, Duck Matthews will, will be a great writer when he suffers more. Yeah. Yeah. You will be greater at what God's called you to do when you suffer more. We got to go through something. You, you can't get it on this side of the pit. You got to get it on that side of the pit. You got to go in the pit. Yeah. Brother Kendrick, where Brother Kendrick? Has he gone on me? Tell him, Sabrina, he'll be better on the other side. He'll be better on the other side of the pit. Some of you will be giving your best songs on the other side of the pit of pain, again, the question could be asked, why didn't God order them to be circumcised on the other side of Jordan in a better state of security? You may be saying, God, why didn't you fix my marriage on the other side when it was just minor problems? You would have thought that you and your spouse fixed it rather than God fixing it. Brother Parker, Sister Parker, y'all very uh, vocal about it, uh, you know, in the marriage ministry, and there ain't no secrets in there. That, well, there's some secrets, some stuff we don't want to talk about, but that one we, we can go on and talk about. Uh, you all went through some things where it wasn't just little stuff. It was big stuff. But God fixed it somewhere along the way. When now, when you walk through that, uh, that, little, that little hallway, you're not trying to not touch each other, but you, you, you kind of hug each other. Just, it's a reason to kind of brush up against her. Y'all been together now 47, 48 years. God fixed it on the other side. But, 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 but if it was just been a little thing, you would have never been able to share nothing with nobody. Because life would have always been grand. But you got to go through some things. Although this would have been the best time to strike their, their enemies, God wanted them to take care of some important spiritual matters. It would have been the best time, the way we look at it, for them to strike their enemies as soon as they crossed the River Jordan before circumcision. It would have been the best time, the way we view it, Brother Johnny, for them to go strike their enemies. But God wanted them to take care of some very important spiritual matters in their lives before moving forward. We like to attack now and handle the other stuff later. But Paul said in Romans 8.31, if God be for us, who can be against us? God may very well be trying to get you to take care of some spiritual matters in your life before you can move forward. Maybe that's what's holding you back. Matter of fact, I know for sure that is what's holding you back. That's part of it. Where God is wanting you to take care of some spiritual matters in your life before he allows you to move forward. The lesson that all of us need to, to really get on today is we are not prepared to do battle with the giants of life until we first become right with God. Remember I said there were giants in the land. That's what, that's what uh, we find, I believe, in Numbers 12 or Numbers 13. We find Joshua and Caleb. We find the 10 uh, spies that came back with the bad report. They said, there in our vernacular, there be giants in the land. They had these big, huge clusters of grapes, and, and they said, yeah, it's milk and honey in the land. There are these clusters of grapes that they had to carry between two men on a pole. They were so large. 
They said there are giants in the land. And Joshua and Caleb said, let us go up at once and possess the land. We can do it. And they said, yes, there are giants in the land. But we can, with God, we can do it. So we know that these giants were in the land. They're still in the land. And, 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 and this lesson that we have to really get is that, 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 that we cannot uh, uh, do battle with these giants, these giant problems uh, in our lives until we first get right with God. Church, you got to get right with God. Oh. Uh, Oh, I see you and feel you too. The same way I had to get right with God, you got to get right with God too. Don't be looking at me thinking about what my reproach may have been in the past. You need to look at what your reproach is right here and right now. You better get it right. You're going to lose every fight in your life. You'll never conquer nothing till you get right with God. You won't, you won't conquer nothing. You'll get up the hill and you'll slide your way right back down the hill until you get right with, with God. Before we're ready to, to do battle, we must first look at our lives and see what things that we have neglected that are important to God. We need to do personal inventory we we need to look to see have we have we pushed God to the to the side we have to look and and, and ask ourselves the questions have I pushed God to the side while I'm tending to things that I think are more important maybe we need to redefine what's truly important to God Maybe we have to ask ourselves the question, have we allowed ourselves to drift in the wilderness? The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 2, verse 1, he said, Therefore we ought to give more, the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience, received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The first sermon I ever preached, December 13th, 1997, was from this text. We have to, to look and, and say, are we neglecting the things of God? But for us today, Circumcision carries uh, an even deeper significance than just identification with our father Abraham. God wants us to uh, learn some lessons uh, from this, uh, this thought of circumcision uh, to something that touches our heart. In, in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, Paul said, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. It symbolizes a cutting off of the flesh, a separation from the fleshly sin nature. Paul said in Colossians 2.11, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. God wants us to have a, a change of heart. In verse number 8 of our text, Joshua 5, and after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Imagine yourself as an Israeli soldier who had just been circumcised. You're lying there waiting to get better. Looking at the city which is in front of you and remembering back to the stories you were told about your forefather, uh, Jacob's son, tricking 
uh, Shechem and his father Hamar and all of the men in their town, he tricked them to get circumcised and they were still there in pain when Jacob's son killed every male in the city. I'm sure the soldiers were, were lying there thinking all sorts of things. Why couldn't this have just been done on the other side of the river? Now we are sitting here like sitting ducks. But, but really it was a tremendous act of faith to remain in their places waiting to be healed. What is it, where is it in your life that you need to just wait to be healed? healed, that, that, that you want to get up and go try to fix it yourself, but God is saying, I just want you to wait where you are until your healing comes. The people had to wait. They had to obey the Lord. They had to trust him even though they were weak, in pain, and vulnerable to the attack of the enemy at this time. They remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. The problem with most of us is that we won't remain in the camp uh, until we are healed. I'm talking about the camps of our, our homes, uh, uh, staying in the camp with sometimes the husband or, or wife. Uh, uh, somebody will break camp before the healing comes. Uh, uh, the wife or the husband doesn't wait until the Lord heals the other. Or uh, maybe the husband doesn't wait, but, but we got to wait, I say, on the Lord. Look with me in verse number Nine, I'm almost done. Uh, verse nine, then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So this place, the place has been called Gilgal to this day. There were many reasons that the children of Israel had uh, this reproach upon their life. Uh, one was they were uncircumcised and this was a reproach for any uh, Jew. It was the grossest impurity for a person that called themselves a, a, a Jew. And, and number two, some of the Jews up until this point had retained the customs and the, the ways of, uh, of the people of, of Egypt. But more specifically, God is referring to the shame of the Israelites for having gone 40 years uh, uh, in the desert without having uh, performed this uh, uh, on the males. I'm just going to say it. I'm going to say it. Now you'll know with the kids here, I'm going to just say it without having this have been performed on the males, the young and old. But then number three, Egypt was a type of the world. I'm talking about the reproach that they had. They had the shame of the world all over them. Uh, you've been there in your own life. I ain't got to tell you where you have uh, found yourself waking up somewhere you know you didn't have no business being. You know, you know, you know the feeling you wake up somewhere, you know, you don't have no business being. And then when you leave from there, you have the reproach, you have the shame, you have the filth. Oh, OK. Nobody. They don't know, Reverend. Nobody else know uh, what I'm talking about. But number four, they were no longer slaves of the past. They were free people with a future. It was time to put away their old way of, of life and to put Egypt behind them and to enter the promised land with confidence and power. Somebody that's here today, uh, you need to know that you are free from your shameful past and it's time for you to put the past in the the past and walk in the, the newness and the destiny that God has ordained for you in your life. The Lord will will make you the head and not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord, uh, your God, that I give to you this day and carefully follow them, you will always uh, be at the top and never at the bottom. God is saying to them that through circumcision, I'm rolling away the shame that you experienced in Egypt. I'm rolling away all the, the shame you experienced when you wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and this subject that we're talking about, this thing that starts with a, a C, it carries the connotation of leaving slavery, leaving death, and discovering freedom, and, and uh, discovering a newness of life. 
In Genesis 17, we find Abraham, who had been unable to conceive a child with his wife, Sarah, was told by God to, to do this thing uh, uh, to, uh, to himself. And later, he discovered a new life through that very thing. There had to be some cutting away of some things. And the Lord told me to tell you today that in order for you to discover the new life that he has for you, there has to be some cutting away of some things. There has to be some shedding of some things. You have to cut away and shed some friends and, and some, some family. Uh, uh, maybe it's that late night creeper that, that you keep answering the, the phone or the text for late over into the night. You got to shed that. You got to cut that out of your life. For others of you, you got to shed some, some debt. You're carrying too much and it's bogging you down to the point you can't even tithe like you, like you should. But some of you, you need to shed and cut away that bad attitude that you have. These children of Israel, they were, uh, they were not children of those uh, in Egypt, but they were born there in the wilderness, and, and now they are discovering true freedom. God is saying to someone here today that he is rolling away all of the disgrace and the shame that you've had in your marriage. Uh, maybe it was an affair that you had, and God is saying that today I am rolling away the shame and the, the reproach of, of all that you have uh, been through. Uh, uh, maybe it was the shame and the reproach of you not being able to provide for your family the way you wanted to. And the Lord is saying, I'm rolling all of that away, all of the shame, uh, all that shame you had in your life. I'm rolling it away. But you got to you got to cut some stuff out of your life, too. It, it's some stuff in your life that's holding you back. And, and, and you need to re renew your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his church. You have to learn and decide, I'm going to renew my commitment to him. I'm going to serve him with everything that's in me. And I'm going to get rid of some things because um, these things are not so important that, I, I, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up in hell because of this stuff that feels good to me, this side of heaven. You got to cut some stuff away. You got to get rid of some stuff and recommit, renew your commitment to the Lord. Follow him with everything that's in you. Lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. And the Bible says he is set down at the right hand of God, uh, we got to follow Jesus. Jesus took an old rugged cross up a hill called Calvary, where the Bible says that he hung, he bled, and he died. Yeah, he died. I'm sure he died. The old folks would say he died. He died on Calvary. Well, that's not the end of the story because the Bible says that he was taken down from the cross. Uh, he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's bar tomb. Well, that's not the end of the story. He was there all night Friday. He was there all day Saturday. He was there all night, Saturday night. Well, but early, early, early on Sunday morning, he got up. He got up with all power, all power. 
in heaven and in earth. You got to roll some stuff away that's been bogging you down for too long. And you got to recommit your life to Jesus. Today is a mighty good day to recommit your life to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, I give you my all. I need you. I need you in every area of my life, every area of my family's life. I need you. The door of the church, it stands open. Jesus is the door. And he says that if any come in, you can come in through Jesus. He will sup with you when you let him into your heart and you can sup with him. You can have fellowship with him, but you gotta let some stuff go.